Now I have the pleasure of introducing another John, uh, John Lewis, who is the founder and CEO of Intos Pharmaceuticals. Uh, John will be speaking to us about his team's experience of developing an RNA vaccine. Uh, so thank you for joining us, John. Take it away. Yeah, no, thanks so much for the, the invitation to speak. Let me get my slides up. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, uh, Antos Pharmaceuticals uh, uh, nucleic acid genetic medicine platform uh, and our efforts during the past year to develop a fusogenics DNA vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, so for those who, of you who aren't familiar with uh, Antos, uh, we're an Edmonton, Alberta-based company. Uh, we were co-founded uh, in 2016 by myself uh, and, uh, and co-founder Roy Duncan. So Roy... Both of us are sort of academic professors as well. I'm, I hold a professorship in the Department of Oncology at the University of Alberta, and uh, and Roy is a professor uh, at the uh, at Dalhousie University uh, in Halifax. And and so we built a, a science based team in Edmonton uh, to to really develop a broad based platform around genetic medicine. Uh, so we've grown considerably in the past year. Uh, we now have offices and labs in uh, in Edmonton, as I mentioned, uh, as well as in San Diego, California. Uh, and we have uh, now have clinical manufacturing facilities in collaboration with the University of Alberta. Uh, and of course, have made our first GMP batches and have, have uh, become a clinical company in the last year. So, so lots of uh, fantastic progress and, and a lot of hard work by the team as well. And so, so at Entos, we have a platform technology uh, and really with the, the emergence of these uh, genetic-based medicines that we've seen through the pandemic, I think we're in a position where we can really imagine a world in the future that does not have genetic diseases. And uh, this is a pretty bold statement, but I think you know pretty much all the diseases, uh, whether they be infectious or, or, or other like cancer uh, or childhood genetic diseases, they're all underlying uh, them are genetics. And now we have the tools to be able to manipulate uh, gene levels up and down and even edit genes in a way to where we can, we can see a possibility in the future where this disease could be cured. And we really see that, uh, you know, one of the key limitations to this future, uh, you know, is the need for safe, effective, and redosable nucleic acid delivery technologies. So if you're looking at DNA or, or nucleic acid delivery technologies, there are really two camps, and uh, I'm sure the audience is well aware. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has really educated everyone on these uh, on these you know different uh, different platforms. So we have one side we have viral vectors. So viruses, as, as you're probably well aware, uh, do a great job of you know they've evolved for millions of years to be able to inject genetic material into human cells. And so we've used uh, you know in gene therapy adeno associated viruses and in, in vaccines now adenoviruses. Uh, to be able to basically exploit their ability to inject genetic material, but to inject, you know, our, our own medicines. And so we have approved gene therapies and now approved vaccines based on these platforms. Um, the real issue is that, you know, viruses are like, somewhat complicated to manufacture. They're, they're pretty complicated to ensure that they're pure, you know, have their cargo inside. Uh, and I guess they're probably their key limitation is the fact that they are immunogenic themselves. So the body mounts, mounts an immune uh, response against the virus itself, and it makes redosing very complicated, both for gene therapies and, and even for vaccines to some degree. On the other hand, we have the non-viral approaches, uh, and, and as we've heard a lot about in this conference already, lipid nanoparticles are sort of at the fore of this uh, uh, technology, and now we have approved vaccines. We, you know, Through companies like Alnylam, we have approved systemic therapies based on LMP technologies. And so these are compelling because, you know, it's really scalable manufacturing, uh, you know, they're non-immunogenic, so they're redosable, um, but they, you know, uh, they do have challenges uh, regarding, in some cases, tolerability, in other cases, regarding the biodistribution. And so we at Entos thought, you know, what if we could harness both viral and non-viral approaches to create a sort of a, 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 a combination technology? So our Entosis Fusogenics technology is based on the com combination of a tiny viral fusion protein. So we have that viral component that I'll get into that's unique to Entos. Uh, and then incorporating, you know, a, a lipid nanoparticle type approach, uh, giving us that, you know, scalability of manufacturing, the flexibility around formulation. And, uh, and we think we've sort of uh, achieved sort of the best features of both the viral and non-viral approaches. And so if you think about what a lipid nanoparticle is, it's a combination of lipids, each performing uh, a different function. 
So we have the pegylated lipids that help with sizing and, and biodistribution and stability. Uh, we have some helper lipids that sort of that help put things together. Probably most importantly are either cationic or ionizable lipids. And so these are really the workhorses of the LMP that achieve both the uh, charge neutralization of nucleic acid for encapsulation and also achieve the, uh, the endosomal escape or delivery. So the primary mechanism by which LMPs are taken up into cells is through endocytosis. And with ionizable lipids, uh, you know, these lipids uh, are neutral until they're taken up into the endosome. Uh, the endosome becomes acidified. Uh, these ionizable lipids be then acquire a positive charge. They change their structure and they basically disrupt the bilayer in the endosome, uh, allowing some of the cargo to escape into the cytoplasm. So this, this physical disruption uh, is, is uh, can become problematic after systemic administration because the uptake organs like liver and spleen, which may take up to, to 85% uh, of, the, uh, of the systemic dose in the first pass, you know, you get these dose limiting toxicities. And so we thought at Entos, the ideal, you know, we love the LMP type uh, approach, uh, but can we use an alternate mechanism of intracellular delivery? And so, um, so this is really the core of our technology and, and, uh, and you know, a really uh, pretty remarkable discovery that, uh, that co-founder Roy Duncan made almost two decades ago now. Now he was working on this fusogenic ortheria virus and it's the only non-enveloped virus to express a fusion protein. And so the envelope viruses uh, use fusion proteins to basically fuse their envelope together with target cells to, to, to deliver or to, to gain entry to cells. This fusogenic ortheria virus is a protein-based virus that once it infects cells, it produces a fusion protein that causes all of the cells around it to rapidly fuse together. And what was remarkable that Roy discovered is that the protein that they use, the fusion protein they use to achieve this is really tiny. So he called them the fusion-associated small transmembrane proteins. Uh, I'm showing it here compared to the influenza HA fusion protein. So you know, HA is, is large, it's multi-subunit, it's got multiple transmembrane domains, it's really quite immunogenic. Uh, but it, you know, it does a very good job of bringing membranes together, mixing lipids and forming them for to, to achieve uh, delivery or fusion. These fusion-associated small transmembrane proteins uh, achieve exactly the same thing, but they're a single transmembrane domain they have a really tiny active domain, just over a dozen amino acids. But importantly, this is sufficient to induce membrane to membrane fusion. And even more importantly, Roy just, uh, demonstrated in 2005, uh, if you incorporate these into a lipid-based uh, nanoparticle, they achieve direct fusion uh, of the LNP or the liposome with the plasma membrane of target cells. So what this does is this completely avoids the endosomal uptake pathway and a lot of the, uh, the sensing signals that are in that endosome pathway, pathway like gas and sting and toll-like receptors and basically uh, allows you to deliver cargo directly to the cytoplasm. And so Roy and I in our academic labs over the past you know, 15 years or so, uh, have uh, so Roy's uh, discovered up to six members of this fast protein family. And really, we've really worked a lot on structure function to figure out what makes them you know, uh, work, what confers their activity, and have, have engineered uh, fully synthetic fusion proteins that we utilize in our current formulation. Uh, and of course, the you know so so our current formulation, we've been able to modify the lipid components, and actually, it's quite flexible in, in what lipids you can put in these formulations, uh, because the fast protein is is doing the doing the work as far as delivery, and so we've worked a lot uh, again uh, with manufacturing to be able to create sort of a lipid nanoparticle type platform with this embedded fusion protein. Uh, we're working closely with Precision Nanosystems and other partners and have optimized a single step microfluidic uh, manufacturing process whereby we can incorporate you know, all in one step, lipids, fusion protein and cargo. And at the other end, you know, we get fully formed particles at very high purity. So we've sort of redubbed this, this platform, a proteolipid vehicle platform. And again, because of the flexibility in the lipid formulation, uh, we've been able to titrate sort of down the ionizable lipid and, and, and you know, look at different ionizable lipids that have great encapsulation properties and, uh, and then optimize formulations for different kinds of cargos. So, um, so, you know, in addition to RNA and siRNA and a lipid nanoparticle type platform, we can also encapsulate plasmid, very large plasmid, even proteins and, and guide RNAs for gene editing. So, and, and as I'll show you, uh, these, despite the fact that these fusion proteins are viral-based proteins, 
they're completely non-immunogenic, so the, this platform is suitable for repeat dosing. Now, I mentioned the manufacturing. Again, we've got a, a great partnership with Precision, uh, and, and so we uh, we love the system and, and you know the idea of being able to use microfluidics uh, uh, because of the scalable manufacturing, being able to, to you know screen two or three hundred different formulations on the bench top, rapidly scaling this up to, to different levels for in vivo, you know, primate studies and, and eventually human studies. We've got this incorporated now. We're working closely with the Alberta Cell Therapy Manufacturing Center at the University of Alberta, uh, you know, making GMP batches of, uh, of the PLV platform now. And with the system we have set up uh, in Edmonton, we can produce, you know, about 400,000 vaccine doses a month in, in Edmonton. And we're looking to scale this up uh, as we move our vaccine through the clinic to, to eventual commercial reality. So I guess there's a couple of sort of science-y uh, 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 things I want to share about the platform. So, so LMPs typically um, don't do a good job of, de of delivering uh, plasma DNAs. So the great thing, we've been able to optimize the formulation. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the delivery of a plasma DNA encoding uh, GFP, green, green fluorescent protein. Uh, and when we incorporate fast protein, we can effectively deliver to a wide variety of different primary cell lines, fibroblasts, hepatocytes, astrocytes, endothelial cells, and, and cancer. Uh, we sort of get great sizing and, and uh, biophysical characteristics of the, uh, uh, of the nanoparticles. And so this is really suitable uh, for, you know, for gene therapy approaches that are typically done by AAV or adenovirus. Uh, but it also works for RNA. So, uh, so again, we've optimized formulations that encapsulate and deliver RNA to, uh, to different primary cell lines with, with high uh, efficiency. Uh, and then we can think about different routes of administration. So, so uh, we've optimized our systemic uh, formulation for very, very high tolerability. Um, because we've been able to remove some of the components that target liver, for instance, uh, we get good systemic biodistribution after IV administration. Uh, you know, this is intramuscular injection. We get a really robust uh, expression of the site and in the draining lymph nodes. Uh, and what's really interesting and, and really a focus for us on the vaccine front going forward is that these particles can be extremely stable. And so we see after oral gavage uh, of a DNA formulation, we get actually really good expression throughout the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So we're looking for, you know, for, uh, in our current uh, intramuscular dosing vaccine development to, to migrate these eventually to oral formulations. So one thing I'll get to, I'm sort of giving away the, the future. So, so uh, Entos uh, has decided to develop a DNA vaccine and, and this data really was the reason why we did it. Um, so, so obviously with RNA, you're getting a lot of delivery, getting a lot of expression of the, the antigen or the, the target protein very quickly. DNA, the kinetics are slightly different. So with the formulation, uh, one of these formulations where we're delivering intramuscularly, we actually get peak expression after two months. And so this prolonged expression of the antigen, we think will provide a built-in booster. And I'll show you some data to support that. And I think this also supports a, some more of an affinity maturation process in the B cell population that gives stronger, more neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and I'll quickly address the, the repeat dosing. So we've done repeat dosing studies, both with intramuscular injection and systemic administration. And I'm just showing a quick study here where we did encapsulated RNA expressing luciferase uh, once a month uh, for five injections. Uh, we actually see a slightly increased expression over time, probably just due to residual uh, RNA expression in the area. We certainly don't see any neutralizing activity. And when we look at the antibodies produced in the animals after repeat dosing, uh, this is the fast protein, anti-fast protein ELISA, basically just above the level, lower level limit of detection of some of the animals, uh, mostly completely nominal. Uh, and what's you know kind of exciting is the fact that we actually see pretty strong titers against the express cargo, which is luciferase. So I'll spend the last few minutes uh, talking about our COVID-19 vaccine program. Uh, so just to put it in perspective, uh, you know, Entos in February 2020 was working really hard with our spin-out company, Oncocenics, to bring a first-in-human uh, cancer gene therapy to the clinic. Uh, we, so we had, you know, we were making drug, we had our PI picked out, we designed the trial, we were, we were planning to start the study. Of course, the pandemic hit. Uh, and we just spent a lot of time before that optimizing a plasma DNA-based uh, gene therapy for cancer. And we thought, you know, this, you know, with all this work we've done in, we, uh, we realized that the genetic uh, vaccine platforms, as we've seen, we, you know, because of our platform technology, really rapid uh, to bring to the clinic uh, and they show to be extremely effective, uh, but they do have limitations. So limitations in their manufacturing scale up, 
Uh, these have been uh, you know, addressed somewhat, obviously, because of the big investment in the, in the area, but also you know, really the, the key issue is the storage and stability, uh, the cold chain requiring this deep cold cold chain, which, uh, which we, can, you know, we can solve in North America, uh, but again, would be really uh, challenging to, to, to move these vaccines worldwide. And we've seen this you know, develop over the past year, year and a half. So I don't need to really talk about the pandemic, just to say that, you know, at the beginning, we were, uh, you know, we we're faced with this, this big challenge. Obviously, the impact has been unprecedented. Uh, previous vaccines against coronaviruses have failed. Uh, but the big difference this time is that we have these innovative new technology platforms uh, that could be brought to bear very quickly, uh, uh, you know, on, on this new threat. And, and, uh, and I always put this in here. Uh, so vaccines, you know, uh, are the most efficient and cost-effective way to prevent and eradicate disease. We believe that very firmly, and, and I think you know our experience with, with uh, coronavirus has shown that. So I just want to quickly give a quick background against you know what is protective in a vaccine. So so we think a coordinated, multi-pronged approach immune response is critical for protection against many diseases, including COVID-19. So on the one side, uh, you want to engage <clears throat> the adaptive response, uh, producing antibodies against the the virus. And so, so this, uh, this basically can bind the, the, the spike protein, which is on the outside of the coronavirus, which engages these two receptor on, on, on target cells in the body and can basically prevent that binding and, and initial uptake. So what's great is this neutralizes the virus, uh, it, you know, blocks it from entering cells. Uh, but the issue is, you know, uh, we're getting more data about this, but uh, the neutralizing uh, activity induced by a vaccine may be short lived. And because it's very, very specific against that interaction, maybe more vulnerable against the escape mutants. On the other side, we have, you know, cell based immunity, you know, basically mediated by T cells. And so, you know, if you generate this immunity, uh, basically have T cells uh, surveilling around the body, looking for cells that have been affected by SARS-CoV-2, and they can recognize these and, and kill them and effectively clear the disease. So what's nice about we get we get a really durable response with T cells. You know, we SARS-1 uh, uh, individuals who've recovered still have circulating T cells to recognize the virus. Uh, and I guess the other big thing, you know, now that we're seeing all these variants, <coughs> T cell immunity, typically doesn't focus on the same epitopes as the, you know, as the neutralizing epitopes. So there's a really much larger potential to, to target conserved pan-coronavirus epitopes. But it, the issue is, is they act, you know, less quickly than neutralizing antibodies. So it doesn't really protect against that initial infection in the upper respiratory tract. So what we, you know, we really love about this genetic vaccine approach is that really because the antigen is expressed in a very similar way that the virus is, ex is, is expressed in the body, we stimulate both an antibody and a T cell response. And so by, by introducing the genetic material inside the cell and getting the cell to make the antigen, uh, you know, we get some secretion of antigen, we get processing of antigen for MHC presentation and, and T cell response. And as you'll as see in a second, having this genetic approach allows us to incorporate genetic adjuvants that can really stimulate and potentiate the responses we want. And in our case, we've incorporated a rig I agonist ligand. Uh, double-stranded RNA ligand in our genetic material, as well as a double-stranded RNA CPG uh, toll-like receptor stimulator. So, um, so uh, this was not done by by Entos alone. We we built really a, a Canada-wide team to go after this vaccine. Uh, we had support early on from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, followed by uh, support from the Canadian federal government as well. And we built a sort of pan-Canadian team all the way from Vancouver to Halifax. Obviously, Roy was a key part of the team. We're working closely with Allison Kelvin, who's at both Dow and at Vito Intervac, uh, PI of our, our clinical trials, Scott Halperin, sort of a leader uh, in, in vaccinology, particularly in first and human. Uh, and then, you know, this whole, uh, obviously, the Entos team uh, working, you know, in a pandemic uh, uh, with the restrictions that we've have, had over the past year. And, uh, and with a key partner, the Alberta Cell Therapy Manufacturing uh, Center. So we chose DNA for very specific reasons. And, uh, and again, you know, key was the stability. Uh, DNA PLV formulations are stable in a regular refrigerator for over a year, uh, room temperature for over a month. Uh, and again, the kinetics of the expression of DNA we thought would make it effective after a single dose. Uh, you know, again, these intracellular uh, genetic uh, vaccines produce a durable T cell response that we think is really critical for both durability and pan-coronavirus protection. Uh, and, 
you know, regarding pan coronavirus protection, we do have two candidates that I'll explain in a second. Uh, our second candidate contains an optimized epitope string with 34 different epitopes against multiple conserved coronavirus domains. And again, we have this, you know, working with the scalable manufacturing platform, we can envision scaling up to hundreds of millions or even billions of doses. So the two candidates Antos developed called VAX001 and VAX002. Uh, VAX001 is now uh, just completed phase one, entering phase two. VAX002 is just on the way to starting clinical development. Uh, the VAX001 is an optimized full-length spike protein in a very minimal uh, nanoplasmid backbone with encoded CVG and rig I adjuvants. And basically this was chosen based on the success uh, and the proven biology of the full-length spike vaccines. Uh, and, and I'll show you, we have really nice data to support that's protective in a DNA vaccine as well. And then VAX002 again is this combination of 34 epitopes, some spike epitopes, but also envelope and membrane proteins, which are really highly conserved between the different coronaviruses. Uh, and again, with these CVG and rig I um, adjuvants. So in our preclinical models, uh, you know, so again, DNA vaccines uh, have been around for years. We, we've known since the early 90s in animal models that DNA vaccines can protect against uh, influenza, for instance. Uh, but really the Achilles heel of, of creating effective DNA vaccines has been the delivery mechanism. So, uh, so clinically, this has been achieved either through electroporation with large doses or through, um, through forced uh, injectors. Uh, but again, typically very, very high doses, you know, one to two milligrams per dose, maybe two or three doses. And so we were looking to achieve uh, basically the similar doses to RNA uh, with either a single or two dose shot. So here, when we uh, deliver VAX001 or VAX002 at 2,500 or 250 micrograms, we get zero conversion. So basically a significant increase in spike specific or antigen specific antibodies in, in every animal we dose at all doses. Uh, so again, significantly lower doses than are achieved with the naked DNA vaccine. And then we look at the neutralizing ability uh, of these antibodies in, in, uh, in pseudovirus neutralization assays. We get you know, very potent uh, neutralization at or above the level that we see in, in a panel of convalescent human patients. Uh, and this seems to be effective against uh, some of the variants. Uh, uh, and where this data continues to come in as, as we get uh, materials to look at additional variants. So then we asked a question uh, about single versus two dose regimens. And I'm just showing you some data here from a uh, non-human primate study where we gave either a single dose uh, or two doses spaced 28 days apart and looked at the pseudovirus neutralization over time. We actually see that single dose and two dose provide exactly the same neutralizing protection. Uh, and this was you know, increasing over time. Uh, uh, so this really gives us a lot of confidence uh, that potentially a single dose would be protective. When we look at T cell response, we get you know, substantial T cell response in all immunized animals. We get specifically a CD8 positive killer T cell response. These are more active CD, uh, CD8 positive cells. They're, they're, they're activated. Uh, and we've actually also created a functional T cell killing assay where we, um, we take uh, CD8 positive T cells from immunized animals, we incubate them with target cells that express the coronavirus spike protein, and we see a dose-dependent increase in the ability of those T cells to kill those spike expressing cells, which gives us a lot of, you know, this is a functional assay to show that these T cells are active in killing cells. Uh, I guess most importantly, we've done a challenge study uh, at uh, Vito in Saskatchewan and Golden Syrian Hamsters. This is a great model uh, because they, uh, they get the disease, they get in the upper and lower respiratory tract, they lose weight, and really their weight loss is, is closely associated with their viral loads. Uh, and we looked at giving both a single dose and two doses in the Syrian hamster. With both single dose and two dose regimens, we saw you know, significant reduction in weight loss uh, in both of them, uh, we saw, if we look at upper respiratory tract, we saw over a log reduction in viral shedding in the, the nasal terminants and the upper respiratory tract. And I think it was really cool is that when we looked at the inflammatory cytokines, so really the pathology of the upper respiratory tract, we saw significant decreases in all these inflammatory cytokines, CXCL10, IL-6, and interferon gamma, uh, you know, which was pretty much identical with single dose or two dose regimen. Importantly as well, we looked at the lung viral load in the immunized animals. We saw you know, substantial uh, reduction in viral load in the lung with either single doses or two doses, up to three log reduction, very significant. 
And again, when we looked at these inflammatory cytokines in the lung, significant, you know, complete almost ablation of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, either with a single dose or two dose, two doses in the, in the lung as well. So, so we're, we're confident and, or at least optimistic that a single dose is going to provide protection uh, as we move into human studies. So we, uh, earlier this year, we started a, a combined phase one, phase two clinical trial of Vaxir01 uh, at the Canadian Center for Vaccinology in Halifax with PI Scott Halperin. Uh, initially, we're looking at two dose levels, uh, 100 micrograms and 250 micrograms, both with two doses, because we're, we're establishing the limits and the safety of the, uh, of the formulations. And so phase one is complete now. Uh, we actually had a bit of a challenge recruiting, you know, in, a, in an environment where uh, approved vaccines, so great news, that approved vaccines are available. Uh, we had a challenge recruiting uh, uh, the very end of the study, uh, but we're going to roll that into the phase two. But it's uh, well tolerated at every dose level, and we're looking forward to starting our phase two portion of the trial. Uh, and we're moving this out of Canada into Honduras, South Africa, and India. We'll be looking at, again, the two dose levels, but now asking the question, can we induce the same immunogenicity either with one dose or two doses? So I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a very busy year for the team, uh, but we're, you know, we're spurred on by the, the great preclinical data, uh, the, the fantastic safety data, and humans, I think, you know, while we're starting to feel the, you know, the, the great effects of having improved vaccines in North America, uh, we're clearly not anywhere near the end of this pandemic. Uh, we view it, you know, less of a foot race and more of a marathon. We need, you know, many, many more billions of doses to be distributed worldwide. We see as the virus, you know, is infecting a lot of people, novel variants are continuing to emerge. You know, the, the, the variant everybody's talking about today is the Delta variant, but there will be more. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we, you know, we think that it's likely to become endemic. And we'll see uh, additional variants come out every year that could evade the current approved vaccines. I guess on a more broad level, Entos is really excited now that we've got this, you know, we're in human proof of concept. Uh, we can essentially write biological software to cure or prevent disease. And, and we really see as no disease out of our reach. Uh, and we're working with uh, close, uh, our spin-out companies, Oncosenex, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, cancer vaccines and cancer gene therapies, ocean biotechnologies, working on age-related diseases like kidney disease and, and, and fibrosis uh, and, uh, and dementia. And then uh, we spun out another company, Aegis Life, uh, to go after not only vaccines, but all infectious disease uh, through their vaccines or therapeutics. So it was, uh, I, I showed the team, but I, I, didn't, I didn't show the, the largest scientific team. We have a fantastic scientific team that's worked you know, really tirelessly over the past year, uh, day and night, uh, to, to really, you know, for, a, for a small company like Endos to bring something now to phase two, I think in this period of time, really speaks to the dedication uh, and expertise of the team uh, that uh, I'm, I'm so proud of. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's attention today. Happy to take some questions.